Um, I think the power integrity is really blossoming this year. Um, you could see it in all the events. There was uh, standing room only in one of my events the other day. There were people sitting in all three aisles. And so what happened between last year and this year, I don't know, but this year power integrity is a thing. Uh, well, there's a couple reasons. Number one is that power integrity really is uh, the fundamental basis of, of really all of our high power and high fidelity systems. So if I don't have good power integrity, we might know that that means that the CPUs aren't going to get the right voltage or the FPGAs aren't going to get the right voltage, but it's so much more than that. Clock jitter is dependent on having very low noise power supplies. Phase lock loops are very sensitive to uh, power supply noise. EMI is heavily influenced by uh, power rail noise. And so power rail noise really is fundamental to the performance and optimization of the system. One of the ways is that the power rail noise actually gets into the phase lock loops on the reference clocks and it impacts the jitter. And the way that it impacts jitter tends to close the signal eyes. And so it's not possible for us to get good um, signal eyes if we don't have good power integrity. There are a couple things really that get in the way. And, and interestingly, Heidi and I did a paper on this uh, just yesterday. And in the paper, we didn't actually have much power integrity issues with the 32 gigabits. And the reason is that the 32 gigabit 30s transceiver is a full differential transceiver. And so most of the power rail noise is, um, it, it, uh, it, it's canceled by the differential effect. What was really interesting is that just turning on the transceiver turned out to be quite a challenge for the power supply. And we couldn't actually turn the transceiver on. But once we got the transceiver on, it was fine. So the transceiver itself doesn't really have a lot of high frequency content. But the transceiver actually draws an operating current of about 600 milliamps. So when you turn on the transceiver, you enable the transceiver, you end up with a 600 milliamp step that's as fast as the FPGA transistor. So blazingly fast, goes from zero to 600 milliamps. The FPGA can't tolerate more than 10 millivolts of noise when that occurs. If you have more than 10 millivolts of noise, it gets into the phase lock loops and it bothers other parts of the FPGA. And there's four of these transceivers. So if we turn on four transceivers, that says you're allowed 10 millivolts for two and a half amps. That's a very low impedance bus. Quite a challenge. One thing that you can do is design a very low impedance power supply. And unfortunately, most people don't think of transceivers as needing very low impedance power supplies. It's just a transceiver. Um, so it really needs a very low impedance design to begin with. Um, the second problem, and actually the problem that we encountered, or one of the bigger problems we encountered in this particular transceiver, is the power supply connected to the motherboard through a connector. And the inductance of the connector was so high that when the transceiver turned on, the power couldn't overcome the connector itself. And yeah, that's really shocking that the 32 gigabits doesn't work because of the connector. But that was the case. Yes, connectors play a huge role at high frequency, but also at low frequency. The interesting thing about this connector, or one interesting thing about this connector, is that it was a Samtech connector, and Samtech builds very good connectors. Uh, Samtech makes S parameter models for all of their connectors so you can simulate them. Except power connectors. Why not power connectors? Because power is just DC, right? And so there is no model for that Samtech connector. Nobody realized what a challenge it would be. Um, and yes, connectors play a very big role, not only at very high frequencies, but even for VRMs. I gave the keynote speech here on Tuesday. And the keynote speech that I gave on Tuesday talked about the fact that we have SI engineers, we have PI engineers, and we have EMI engineers. And when you get down to it, they're all really measuring the same exact thing, but they're measuring it in different ways. And it's fascinating, but we have different words for the same things. We speak different languages. And so we can't talk to each other. But the resonances in power planes are the sources of the signal integrity and the EMI. They're all the same thing. 
If we can get the impedance to be well controlled and flat, we have good power integrity, we have good signal integrity, and we have good EMI performance. And the challenge is getting all three of those to be good at the same time. This is my favorite subject. Uh, I call this the holistic ecosystem. And so what I teach in my workshops is that we have to do this holistically. You can't design power integrity without worrying about signal integrity and EMI. And here's a fascinating statistic. My company did six workshops around the country last year in conjunction with Rodi and Schwartz. And one of the questions we asked everybody in the workshop is um, what is your area of specialty? This is a power integrity workshop. 10% of the people in our workshop were related to power. 90% of the people in our power integrity workshop were not. I mentioned this to Eric Bogadin before his uh, tutorial here yesterday, and he asked the same question in his tutorial. How many people here are power integrity people? 10%. And so what this tells us is that power engineers design their power supply. They don't really worry about anything else. They throw it over the wall. The signal integrity guys and EMI guys say, oh my God, it doesn't work. And they come to the workshop to learn how to fix it. These three areas all do affect each other. And the conclusion of my keynote, which was about what challenges are we going to face in 2023? And I said, in 2023, we just get a little bit more concentrated than we are now. Circuits get smaller. Performance requirements get higher. Budgets go lower. Design cycles get shorter. There's no way in 2023 that you just get by. You either have an optimum design or you don't. There's not gonna be just get by. And so what that means is that these three areas, SIP, I, and EMI are gonna learn, need to learn how to talk to each other. And one of the ways that we'll do that is through simulation. And that's one of the reasons that I work so closely with Heidi Barnes at Keysight is that we can tie all of these areas together through simulation. And ADS is a very powerful simulator that's capable of, of assessing power integrity, signal integrity, and EMI simultaneously. Simulation will become the fundamental center point that ties together SI, PI, and EMI. But there's another aspect to this also, and I teach a lot of workshops in Detroit. And I feel for Detroit. Uh, automotive engineers have a very tough life. Um, they have a, a you know, new design every year. The dates are fixed. You're not gonna you know, hold back the model year. They have to have the latest technology. They have very short design cycles. It's a very, very tough world. And they say to me, Steve, how do we save a board spin? Tell me how to save a board spin. We'll pay you any amount of money if you just save a board spin. And I said, here's the secret. The secret is that if you want less board spins, you have to make more boards. And they say, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. And I said, it does, it makes perfect sense. And this is where Sierra Circuits gets involved. So before you design that VRM into your 20 layer circuit board, you really need to know that that's a good VRM and that it meets the performance you need. So I say you put that on an express prototype board, you evaluate the VRM and you say, you know what, I really like that VRM and I know everything about it now. And now you can put it on a 20 layer board with confidence and you know that it's gonna work. And I promise you building those extra boards saved you a very expensive board spin and it made your design cycle shorter. And I have to say that, you know, design kind of been involved with for probably a decade. And I think that uh, one of the things that's really a, a focus of design con is that you'll see SI, PI, and DMI engineers here. So even though we don't speak the language, we get to know each other. I think we're building rapport and I think we are, are actually learning from each other. But people ask me, what is it like being a design con? And I say the same thing every year. It's like drinking from two fire hoses at the same time. What's my favorite part about this year at design con? I would have to say it's being the keynote speaker, but I don't think that's what you mean. So I think secondary to that, um, to me it's thrilling to see that power integrity has increased in interest so much over last year. And it was fascinating to me to see all of the power integrity sessions jam-packed full with people sitting in the aisles. Uh, for me, that was really thrilling.